from deep in the wilds of Pittsfield Township, Michigan, it's the Grace and Paul Potscast. She's a left-wing conservative Catholic homeschooler who loves to garden. He's a bearded computer geek who reads and writes like he's running out of time. Together, they're raising an ever-growing army of adorable children and planning the revolution. Hello! That was the wilds. Those are the wilds. Yeah. yeah, we were supposed to have actual sound effects and whatnot. We have a very low production budget right now. <laughs> we keep planning on recording the coyotes outside, but yeah, hasn't yeah. Happened. We have had coyotes, <laughs> real coyotes outside. Anyway, we have a guest. This is Anna. Anna Marco. Anna Marco. Hi, everyone. <laughs> yeah, welcome to the show, Anna. And you're you're where Thanks now? Having me. You're, you're where uh, now? I live in. I live in New York City. I live in Brooklyn. Um, I also am um, one of the hosts of the Breadline podcast, the leftist food podcast that just kicked off recently. Right on. Um, We will put a link in the show notes. To your podcast. Yeah. Yeah. And you are a millennial and Mm -hmm. you work now as a pastry chef. Is that right? I do. Yeah. uh, So I work in uh, restaurants. I make the, the fancy expensive plated desserts in a restaurant um which is uh it drives me nuts that it's something that not everybody can afford to enjoy but oh, yeah. it there, there is fulfills, a, it fulfills a creative need for me so mm-hmm. it's, and it's a very basic pleasure way you know it yeah. is it a is, is. Yeah. it's, it's a basic very pleasure. it's in, it's incredibly satisfying to work with my hands and create something and also as somebody who really loves um fruits and vegetables to not to do as little as possible to a perfect piece of fruit or something uh-huh. is, is oh, yeah. kind of one of the best pleasures there is you know to to capture the essence of something in a sorbet or an ice cream or just to simply roast a peach or something it's it's um it's, kind of really nice to appreciate to, to get the opportunity to appreciate what people grow um, yeah, yeah, more than, yeah more than i would otherwise now, yeah. We took the opportunity to have a nice meal before this podcast, right? So we wouldn't spend we, it salivating. We made sure <laughs> we made sure that we ate a filling meal because when you we knew that if you started talking about desserts, we'd right. be like drooling on our microphones. <laughs> We're like what, three minutes in, and I'm already in trouble. Yeah, just roasting yeah. peaches. <laughs> yeah. So we'll we'll also share. You put uh, pictures of some of your creations on Instagram. Is that? that I do. Yeah. Yeah. I'm okay. oh, I'm on. I'm on Instagram and Twitter, um, both as very small Anna. Instagram I use um, more professionally. It's just almost entirely work, work photos, um, finished products, and then and then Twitter. Right. You know, you get to you get to listen to me yell at people about politics, oh. but, yeah. but also yeah. get a lot more a lot more stream of consciousness and pictures yeah. of things as I'm working on them and ideas being bounced around. So it's it's. Yeah, kind of fun. I I uh, approached you for the show and all this entirely on the basis of happening to stumble across you on Twitter and then um, following like uh, a, a link to your podcast and listening to that and I'm like I should talk to this person. She needs to be on <laughs> yeah, the show. no, I'm I'm glad you did. We had a we had a good conversation about food and um, I'm I'm really excited that we're doing that podcast. I was I was so happy when I was contacted. Um, by uh, Matthew, the guy who puts everything together, because um, mm-hmm. he wanted to start it. Um, so t- tell me a little, I haven't heard the podcast. Tell me a little bit about it. What's the, w- what's it about? So every episode is about the intersection of food and politics from a leftist perspective. So that's okay. a lot how, how the entire food network is connected and mm-hmm. all food is inherently political. People don't want to talk about that very much you know and it's like you know you know that everybody knows now that you know the way we're cracking down on immigration is causing problems with crops getting harvested climate is causing problems to what we're growing 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 zones are changing um right now we've got um for example just today i saw articles about how the uh smoke from the wildfires in california is inhibiting the sunlight from reaching crops and allowing them to ripen fully 
Um, wow. There's also the issues of uh, apparently a lot of um, poultry farms in North Carolina are literally oh, yeah. underwater right yeah. now, yeah. as well as all of the pig farms um, with their their runoff lagoons. <sighs> Manure it's lagoons. A serious, disgusting problem. Yeah. Which I mean, they shouldn't have existed in the first place. And right? We all know this. Yeah. But we all know this. But they do. And now so we have a public kind of, health problem. Yeah, right. that's the kind of stuff we talk about. How, you know, and we we dig a little deeper too, and we get some interviews, and we get some good quotes, and encourage yeah. a lot of um, audience participation. We want people to to call us and to direct message us and just mm-hmm. help us dig a little bit deeper on any given topic because there's always more sure. we can say about everything we talk about. Mm-hmm. I was, uh, it was, I think it was in the first show. I forget uh, which one of you did this, but basically one of you rattled off a list of topics mm-hmm. and it was like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that you, was Matthew. Um, he had, yeah. and if he you had un- a handwritten list that he sent us a photo of right. that he wrote out and it and, was, it was exhaustive. Yeah. And if you unpacked, all those topics, all of which were closely related to both food and politics, of course, right. that like would be years of shows, right? Years. You know, they could yeah, be spin-off no, shows. So. Right. Right. I mean, we are, yeah. we've only technically our first episode was an intro, so technically yeah. we only have two real episodes, yeah. and the newest one is one of two because we started A talking yeah. about about um, food assistance, and there was just so much more to say than. Right. And yeah. we try to keep the episode short, but there was just too much. So there's a second episode coming out very soon yeah. about that. They did a they did a show about uh, food in prisons too, which I know uh, very little about, but is yeah. like uh, I think a topic people really do need to hear about. Hear about it. You know, yeah, it was that was really enlightening. There was a lot of a lot of um, I enjoy doing research for the show just yeah. to to really dig deep on a topic and see you know what what we don't know about something and and Mm -hmm. then we got we got several people for that episode actually messaging us saying that they went to a certain prison and it's that's what it was like and we eventually got um in contact with one of them to to record something for us and it was just heartbreaking it it was yeah it it was I mean, like, you know, it's sort of cliche to say that something is gripping, but, you know, I, I listen to a lot of podcasts at work while I'm on the computer all day, and yeah. most of them I can continue to work, but some of them I'll just, like, stop and stare, you know? Yeah, <laughs> and that yeah. was one of the stop and stare into space, like, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, that was that was heavy. I remember um, getting sent the audio file for what that guy said. I, was, I had just left the movie Sorry to Bother You, actually. Oh, really? And, and Matthew... Um, sent me that and i was just walking down the street listening to it just like had to stop for a second i was like that's he he broke down so many things we didn't even talk about like Mm -hmm. he he was in alaska and the local indigenous population they're they're still eating their their traditional diet up there and then you throw them in prison and they have to subsist on cup noodles and moldy bread and that's a huge unhealthy shock to someone's system yeah of course yeah right and wow. wow. Okay, so uh, <laughs> yeah, I know. That's we'll, I know. <laughs> we'll we'll include um, links to to that podcast. And mind you, and there hope, are people. Some of them may be listening. Yeah, that enjoy cup of noodles. Sure, right? That's not the but point. That's not the point. <laughs> that, yeah, that's no. That's, 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 that's it's not different. The point. It's, it's different when that's the only thing you can right. buy right. from the can commissary eat. to right. supplement what they're the, the inedible things that they're giving you. Yeah, right. Yeah, you wouldn't. You know, even the people who like to eat that for lunch, you wouldn't probably enjoy having it Daily, every day. You know, three meals a day. With, like, I, yeah, I did recently else. see see a piece about a formerly incarcerated man who started a business selling uh, like cup noodles to prisons that have much lower sodium, which is well, a that, huge uh, band-aid, but at the same yeah. time, he is doing something materially. Yeah, it's a start. It improves the lives <laughs> yeah. of prisoners. So, right, right. You know, and yeah. I'm just, that's as a, a side note, there are people being paid to serve the food that's inedible. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, and then the prisoners yeah. have to buy food they can eat. It's it's an interesting little setup. Yeah. It's worse than yeah. that in it's, some places. It's a, whole, it's a whole little... It's. I believe it's the term is racketeering. Designed. I yeah. think racketeering is the term. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It is. I mean, they're designed to generate revenue, the companies that run the commissaries, and yeah. they, they're the same companies that run the cafeterias. And yeah. if they can make the food inevitable, so the... I mean, inedible, so the uh, prisoners end up buying things from the commissary that's a, that's it's built a into win. the system right. it's a right. win both ways that's, right. that's what it's designed to do 
And then I know they sell their families incredibly marked up things they can ship as care packages. Right. right. Too. There's, yeah, the care package. They have That's, a huge markup on the products. Things yeah. that, it's two or three times as much, but you have to get it through their vendors. And right. they're doing the same thing with a lot of books and mm -hmm. just restricting access to anything that's not through an approved vendor, which is really just a great metaphor for the way society is going at this point. Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. And they, have, and they have no choice. That's their only access to anything. Right. right. And, yeah, yeah. And this, this scam that's come the surface recently about, oh, was it a sheriff in Alabama? Uh, mm -hmm. is yeah, running, yeah. They're basically funneling his food budget um, into uh, a home, like a beachfront, a house, or uh, and, yeah, uh, it's a, it's a, it's an antiquated law that's still put into practice, where instead of so it's legal funding, yes, so it used it's from when the from like the 30s even when the sheriff and his wife used to have the jail attached to their home because they'd only ever house like two to three prisoners yeah, at a time yeah. right. and the sheriff's wife would cook the meals for everyone and they'd get so a stipend that's for... still yeah so that's still the law there is that they're, they're just paid personally to provide for the inmates right but they personally have control of the money it goes into their account it does not go into the the state budget or account. prison budget yeah, and anything a, they didn't yeah. actually spend on food he was allowed to just skim off and use for his own purposes yeah i mean it's 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 going to court now that guy has a lot of allegations against him uh, I'm including sure. um including some sexual assault allegations <laughs> so he's he's obviously a real winner i'm um, shocked but the, yeah it's it's just crazy that it's such an old law and it's being abused so flagrantly yeah right. Right. Yeah, and most of this stuff is like, you know, I consider myself kind of plugged into, you know, left media and all that. But some of it's still, you know, I'm, I'm still sh capable of being shocked and learning new things all shocked the time as evolved. stuff yeah. comes yeah. up. And the prison strike is helping to uh, sh share, like, share shed a lot, a lot of light lot of and yeah. share a lot of information about yeah. conditions yeah, for, absolutely. for inmates. So. I think I think officially the strike is technically over at this point it was yeah. a certain span of time yeah i think it ended um, september 9th yeah yeah but it, it it did help there was a lot more visibility going on with issues mm -hmm. um i think at this point now they just started to lay down extra charges or whatever for the um prisoners who were on strike um no, the ones who were who were victimized by the the riot in South Carolina that that inspired the whole strike, oh, um, where the the guards basically instigated and then looked the other way, and now oh. of course they're going to punish punish the prisoners yeah, for it. Yeah. So I, that's I don't know a ton of details on what's developing with that, but I know they're now that the strike's over, they're going to start cracking down on a lot of the people who participated. Yeah, Good. well, Which, I, just, I mean, is to be expected. But. Right. right. Yeah. Well, well um, if we want to back up maybe and um, maybe you'd like to give us a little background on sort of uh, how you got how do you, how you got to where you are like how you navigated your uh, your upbringing and your uh, early life and career because yeah this is part of a series on millennial economics and we're interested in how this like most screwed of generations <laughs> is <laughs> is getting by and faring and also uh, i think we would like to make this a resource for maybe other millennials who might you know get some inspiration or ideas or inspiration insight any insight yeah or just you know uh some uh companionship on the journey yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, yeah so so whatever you'd like to share about sort of like how you got to where you are okay um I'm from Maine originally, um, mm -hmm. and I grew up in a pretty, pretty liberal household. Um, my parents um, were always into the idea of like a co-housing or commune group, but it never really worked out. So they ended up buying a nice house and starting a garden in the back, which is a nice, a nice way to settle. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, you know, I grew up with that. I'm not really a gardener myself. Mm -hmm. um, I'm kind Grace of and I of, met through. I'm kind of, kind of more of a, a seek and destroyer in the garden because I will oh. totally harvest everything. <laughs> but yeah. I don't know how to keep it alive. Don't underestimate <laughs> that role. That's yeah, a critical yeah. role. 
Yeah. It is. No, you sent me out to water, and you're going to have half as many sugar snap peas as you did. <laughs> water, so. Grace and I were very uh, trying to get engaged in local co-housing stuff going on in Ann Arbor years like about, ago, yeah, uh, like shortly after we met. Yeah, yeah. so we're, we're kind of familiar with yeah, with that it's, stuff. It's, yeah, it's tricky. They they tried something. Um, I mean, when I was six years old, this is something I've been I've been thinking about a lot lately because I I do not want to stay in this city forever. Mm-hmm. Um, is when I was six years old, we went out on a family trip to uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico. We went to we went to Colorado a little bit too, but we were mostly in New Mexico mm-hmm. um, because of there were the their earth ships that some guy was building oh, out yeah. there. Yeah. They were made of they were made of plastic Ty- bottles, tires, and stucco. <laughs> oh. And they were they yeah, I mean shit. they were they that's, were that's some, they really some, are right. really one now. Um, yeah. that's but, some yeah, serious yeah, we hippie out, stuff right there. Yeah, yeah. we really went out is. to see that when I was six years old, but the, the landscape has stuck with me ever since. It's the most beautiful place yeah. ever been. I, I really, really want to go back. It's marvelous, um, yeah. Yeah. So it's so there was that and then there was a group at, back in Maine that had a big tract of land out in the middle of the state in the middle of nowhere like a lot of people don't realize how big maine is and oh, how yeah. much the population is concentrated yeah. in the very tiny bottom right. coast and the map the map I'm is from. distorted it doesn't really show how, it, it how big is. it is and then the yeah. rest of it is just is just forest and mountain forest it's just yeah. empty forest and the top of the appalachian trail which is a totally different part of the state than where mm. i'm from it's, it's right. completely there's parts of maine where nobody's speaks English because they're all Quebecois. They all speak French. Like I have friends who I have have a good childhood friend whose dad didn't speak English till he was like 10 years old or something like that. Like it's a, it's a strange state, but yeah, anyway, we were involved with a group out there and I think they were just taking too long and they were, to my recollection, were a little cultish. So my parents, you know, hit the brakes on that one. (laughs) And they, uh, like they, when it, before the, before we had our own house, they they were renting farmland and growing stuff too. So that mm-hmm. was something they were always interested in. Um, and it was it was you know it was a great way to grow up to kind of grow up with a lot of with green party meetings in my in my living cool. room and yeah. you know mm-hmm. Peter Paul and Mary playing all the time. And stuff. <laughs> <Now> that, <laughs> that's the sound of my childhood. You're, you're, well, that's. That was early, even for for Peter Paul and Mary. So I mean, like, yeah. that yeah. would have been your parents' music, not, not yeah, right. yeah, absolutely, right. absolutely was. Um, so that that's that's how I grew up. Um, and then as I got into high school, um, realized that I didn't. It was in advanced classes, but I hated academia and everyone was being pushed into you know I got, you get to the point in high school where you realize everything is just college prep yeah and yeah. i was like that seems like a trap and i and not there's like nothing else it's more and so there's like nothing else yeah, and, and it was more so for your generation it was a little less so for my generation yeah, and then it's, it's definitely a, a newer phenomenon is how how yeah. at least the second half of high school and i'm sure it starts even earlier now, now yeah it's just college prep and assuming that everybody's going to go to college and get a textbook education it's and that was never for me i always i was always and standardized yeah, testing was always and stem now. oh god i i so many all the standardized tests i i by the time i was in high school i was just writing essays that were basically comedy bits i was trolling at an early age that was, <laughs> like it's it's no wonder 14, that i already took to yeah, twitter yeah. And <laughs> but um i was i was lucky enough to have teachers who basically were like we're gonna pass you anyway we know you don't care it's fine like, <laughs> it's, it's cool <laughs> like i got i ended up getting my diploma through the state instead of my high school because they required like less math credits or something and i was oh. like what do i even need geometry for that's not like it passed past level two this is really i'm not a, i'm not gonna be an engineer we all know this so um <laughs> Mm-hmm. so I did that and then I was like I don't know what I'm going to do with my life I worked uh, I went and I was really lucky and then I had a, a college fund for my grandparents mm-hmm. um, and I took some money out of that and I bought a car and I got a job and mm-hmm. I worked in retail for the next five years um, mm-hmm. and I have I had a safety net that a lot of people my age and younger just didn't have yeah. Uh, yeah. which right. is gone now because I used the rest of it to go to pastry school once I realized yeah. that was a thing right um, right 
I was I was thinking about going to after those five years, I was thinking about going to either art school or cooking school. And then I found out that pastry chef was a job you could have. I <laughs> cool. honestly you can do that. Didn't know that. So, <laughs> you could like bake cookies uh, for a living. Right, right. <laughs> like that was my favorite thing to do. I was I was cooking a lot at home and I was like, Well, if I can do this for a living, that would be ideal. Um so I ended up uh, spending everything that was left to move to the city and um, and start taking classes at a pastry school and, and mm-hmm. worked my way up from there. Um, but so what, it's, what is a pastry? What is a pastry school? Really, is that part of a culinary institute or? It's, it's part. Of, it was part of. A, it was a six month um, program. There are there are actual colleges that are two and four year degree programs. This was just a six month certificate. Mm-hmm. They just had a, a really great um, job placement um, nice. program, right. and so it was really easy to get a good internship and to get help. You know, you can you can contact them anytime, and they'll help you out. They're still they're still great like that. Mm-hmm. Um, so you come out of that program, and then you're ready to intern with the restaurant. Is that the? Oh, uh, then you're ready um, to hire. You're ready to be hired. Uh, yeah, I did. I did an internship during my last few months there. My last two to three months, I did um, an internship at a local uh, Michelin starred restaurant, which is the fanciest of the fancy restaurants and yeah. the fanciest place that I have have actually I, I literally haven't worked at a michelin star restaurant since so that was the fanciest place i've ever um worked in technically mm-hmm. um i just kind of worked in small restaurants after that uh which unfortunately the problem with that is a small restaurant when they're having problems making ends meet mm. usually because the landlord has jacked your rent again which is a yeah. huge problem here in the city now uh the first apartment they cut is pastry because they decided it's not important not so I literally can get had pre-made my department eliminated yeah. twice right. oh, over the course of my career, and they were they were departments where I was the only one running it. They're just like we're just going to get rid of you and your department. And it's like, oh, thanks. Okay, I thought <laughs> I'm like having thing? have fun filling all those special cake requests for the next month. Yeah. <laughs> Good luck with that. It's not my problem now, I guess. <laughs> right, um, right. But yeah, it's a it's it's. It's tricky. It's kind of, it's interesting in that I'm, I'm doing something that I love doing that makes me happy, um, that I get to work with my hands and create something that is the most tangible that you can create mm-hmm. and that it can be consumed and it makes, it's there just to make people happy. Oh, and yeah. at the same time, it's something that is overpriced. And for the most part, I am feeding people that I wouldn't. <laughs> like, help on the street because I know they're <laughs> so wealthy that they don't yeah. care about me. Like it's it's sad that I want to I want to feed my friends and I cannot. Yeah. Because oh, yeah. they cannot afford it. Maybe maybe fair. we will <laughs> I was thinking about reading a passage from Orwell's Down and Out in Paris and London to talk that about That is a great book. Well, yeah. Okay, so you're familiar with it. So maybe I'll pull yes. that out after it was, uh, this it was section. recommended to me at one of my first jobs by uh by a waiter. Oh really? <laughs> yeah. Read this. Yeah. He said that he said that the, the passages about uh all the 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 cooks sweating in the basement uh oh, yeah. reminded him of me. Yeah. <laughs> Which is very, very, very yeah. apt. Yeah. Uh, you've probably also read Kitchen Confidential, then, right? Yeah. yeah. And so, yeah, it's been a while. Yeah, Kitchen Confidential struck me as just sort of a updated version of Down and Out in Paris, and London, in a way. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. Um, and Orwell gets into some specific political insights as well, you know. So, but and, and sorry, I don't want to derail you, but you're you're uh, we're working in pastry departments that were were shut down because of like you say the rent rents in all cities now are too a huge damn problem yeah the rent is too damn high yeah it's, <laughs> and it's, no, it's crazy it's not just it's you know new york city it's it's even in ann arbor michigan you know like yeah, it's a the restaurants that i grew up loving you know the hole in the wall places most of them are gone oh, the best hole in the, holes in the wall yeah. Are all gone. yeah or they've yeah. left for yeah. like strip malls way on the outskirts of town yeah yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, funny enough, in my back in my hometown, um, a lot of the restaurants, a lot of the good restaurants that have been there since I was a kid are still there. There's mm-hmm. just more restaurants. The mm-hmm. old ones don't go away; they stay there. But there's more now, and it's it's kind of insane how many restaurants there are per capita up in a lot of the 
the bigger towns and the cities in Maine. Like, really? it's like Port- Portland, Maine has the most breweries per capita in the entire yeah, country. Yeah. Everybody wow. goes there to everybody. Everybody moves up there to open restaurants. It's relatively cheap. It's a very seasonal business, but oh, you yeah. still have locals year round. Mm-hmm. Um, you have access to all the best seafood and stuff like that. So yeah, well, know, Maine has an amazing food culture. Mm-hmm. I, I'm from it Southern. Really New, does. Yeah, I'm from Southern New England. So. You know, I've got a taste of Maine. We used to drive She's, up. She spent some time up there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, and really, what I've discovered over the last thirty years is that Maine has decided that they're they're doing tourism. Like you know, like some some states like have it as part of their thing, as part of their like portfolio. Maine's doing it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, you can hardly up, help yeah. it because everybody right. everybody's already coming up there for the summer anyway. They're there anyway, right? It's so built in. There's no no reason yeah it's it's just you just have to accept it that Mm -hmm. that was i mean working in retail we got used to it it's you know you would have your busy holiday season but the summer would be tourist season and you would make a lot of money yeah almost as much as the holiday season you just have to know that you were also playing tour guide to the customers you know you have people coming in and i i literally i worked in a record store in my hometown and i had people coming in and asking like where they could get some really nice craft beer. And I, so I sent them to my favorite place and they came back the next day to tell me it was great. But it's, mm. so it's, it is living in the town means that you are everybody's tour guide. Mm-hmm. Exactly. At, at some point, somebody's going to ask you <laughs> right. for a recommendation and you yeah. better know you where better to know. send them because yeah. you're going to yeah. see them again next year. <laughs> They're right. going to come back. You'll see them again. And I think like Maine's embraced it. Mm-hmm. A lot of places are kind of they don't yeah it's uh, like Massachusetts doesn't embrace the locals it. don't like it yeah. right yeah no I mean it's it's I mean I would say that nobody really likes having a tourist season but the yeah. fact that the economy is so dependent on it and that mm-hmm. everybody knows that may, I mean I I don't really visit up there outside of the summer or mm-hmm. the warmer months at least just right. just because it's so miserable in the winter yeah um, so I've I've become a tourist too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> now, Al, um, I'm wondering though, like, so how do you feel the economy is treating you, given all that's come to pass and the ups and downs of of uh, having departments close and you know having to find new work, etc. Uh, what, how, like, what's your sort of like a one sentence takeaway? How's the economy treating you? And then kind of unpack that. Um. I'm basically currently stuck at my current job because mm-hmm. there are no other viable jobs. I'm not crazy about the um, restaurant group that I'm working for, which if mm-hmm. you did any digging, you could figure out who it is and what, why I might not be happy there. Mm-hmm. Um, but there are really no other options. And this um, is New York City. This is New York City. Okay, There's yeah. no other options right now. It's not Sandusky. Okay, just checking. Hmm. It's... No, that's it's it's become almost a running joke that anytime I I look at Craigslist or anything, for some reason every steakhouse in the city is hiring a pastry chef and no one else is, and none of them need a pastry chef because their entire dessert menu is like a molten chocolate cake and some vanilla ice cream. <laughs> and why do you need somebody who to make that is usually, yeah. you know, it's they just want people to make like party cakes for VIP clients, and I'm. I don't it's want not to do that. that. Interesting. It's, not, yeah. it's not that interesting, and I'm kind of at the point where it, a lot of the restaurants that are surviving and are doing really well are the ones that are catering to celebrity clients, and you're supposed to be wrapped up in that culture. And I did that yeah, at the beginning yeah. of my career, and I don't ever want to do it again. I, I genuinely don't care who's eating the food. Right. It doesn't okay. matter to me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put it out just as nice for anyone else. Mm-hmm. Um, so oh, yeah. that that's that's kind of it's kind of annoying that that's that's how it is. People it is. people yeah. can't just go out for a nice night. They can't afford to. So you get the same regulars all the time, mm-hmm. um, you know. And then you get and then you get the the VIPs, and it's just really <clears throat> it's stressful and annoying to be expected to be excited by it all the time. It's it's right. not it's not it's not exciting. People are people, and everybody needs to eat, and everybody wants ice cream sometimes. <laughs> So yeah. Um, so yeah. So yeah. The, no, the the economy is not great here. There's there's the rent situation. There's the fact that the market is simultaneously both too small and too big. There's too mm-hmm. many people opening restaurants who have no business opening restaurants, which has always kind of happened. Mm-hmm. But now you've got um, 
with with food being a big thing that people care about now with celebrity chefs being such a huge mm-hmm. thing you have lots of kids going into culinary school and coming out and thinking they're ready to be a chef and they're not you really have to you have to work a long time to know enough to run a kitchen. Right. Yeah, Bourdain so, called it I, I making mean, your bones, all those years of yeah, making you do. your bones. you do. You have to know what you're doing. You have to know every single station of the kitchen. You have to know You have to know a lot. There's. It's right. not just technicality. It's not right. just yeah. can you butcher a chicken, can you cook a perfect steak. Right. There's so much more to it. You know, there's there's costing, there's hiring, there's menu development. You know, when you develop a menu, you have to know how practical it is, if you can actually execute everything every time. So we've got the market flooded with people who are willing to take less money for more responsibility. And it leaves people who have more experience out in the cold. Mm-hmm. Um, my mm-hmm. husband's had a really hard time finding a job. We worked for a cafe for a while together um, after mm-hmm. one of my apartments closed. Um and the place ended up closing down. Um, I don't really want to say unexpectedly. We weren't told in advance, but it wasn't surprising. A little shock. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It was. It was. And it was. We knew. We knew the owners were in debt. And we knew they were trying to get another loan or get another partner to come on to help build them out of the hole they were in. But basically, the uh, they were trying to renegotiate the lease, and the landlord said no. Mm-hmm. And the landlord said, "I would rather get somebody else in here who's willing to pay more money off the bat." And mm. they closed the place down. And because it's a landmark building, he couldn't get anyone to come in because you can't build any improvements on it. It's landmarked. And now he's just trying to sell it. So it's just been sitting empty for well over a year now. Oh, this um, is hard. And that's, that's what, yeah, that's what's happening. That's There's a lot be of heartbreaking. Places that just, <laughs> I know. They just sit empty forever, which is a huge contrast to going back to my hometown. And there yeah. are no, yeah. no, no empty still whole fronts. Fronts. Right. Everything is open and it's busy. I hear that this is happening in London in that everyone's just treating the properties as investments. investments. A lot of overseas yeah, investors that's, that's that a huge, don't that's live there. That's a huge there. problem here. I read a great piece about it. I, it may have been in the New Yorker or something. It was this really long, in-depth piece about um, foreign investors coming into New York. Mm-hmm. And they're, build, you know, they're building new high-rises, and it's actually going to start killing Central Park because it's not going to get enough sun. Um, and they're, oh, yeah. they're, they're, they're apartments that are sold before they're even finished and they're never lived in ever they're just assets they're wow. nothing but assets for people who don't live here and they might come visit once a year and that's it it's well, that's it, sick. it's bizarre no, that's it's, sick the sound you hear in the background is me sharpening my guillotine blade <laughs> <laughs> as we all should yeah. <laughs> It's I, yeah. It's it's getting really bad. There are parts of the city where you walk around and you just see it. There, there are neighborhoods. If I go, if I go to, the, I I try not to go to the Lower East Side because it used to be. I, I've only lived here. I've lived here a little under ten years, and it's still changed so much just in ten years. Mm-hmm. It used to be such a great area. It's still still a lot of a big nightlife neighborhood. You know, there's a lot of bars, but a lot of the places we used to go to eat at three in the morning aren't there anymore and the blocks are completely demolished and they're wow. building high rises there. Oh. And there are places that are there that are landmarked and they sold the air rights above them so they are building on top of them. And it's just becoming a totally, <laughs> totally different neighborhood. I think even the guy Chris is making this, terrible- this facial expression like that's a thing. What? Yeah, <laughs> it's, yeah. Air rights are a thing. Air rights are a thing, and you can sell them here. Everything is for sale here now. It's it's oh. absurd. It's wow. absolutely absurd. And I pla- told you know, you I places hate New that York. have been here for so long. It's just like neighborhoods feel like they've been completely picked over. You know, and and mm-hmm. you walk uptown, and you can kind of feel the even before I, I worked on 60th street right off of billionaire row for like three years. And even before I worked up there, I always got uneasy going up there. But if I go up there now, it's just like, I start, I start like hyperventilating. It's just, it's just gross. Wow. It's, it's gross. You can, yeah. feel, you can feel it emanating from the buildings. How gross it is. <laughs> feel the smarm. Yeah. That's disgusting. Yeah. That's too bad. Yeah. So, so it's I'm a nice not, city. You know, why would you do that to a city? You know what I mean? Yeah. No, it's things. Things aren't changing Ugh. and becoming different. They're changing and becoming homogenous. homogenous. And it's really, it's really sad to see. I remember, this was like maybe twenty years ago. My brother, we were talking about trying to figure out where we wanted to live and how we wanted to raise a family and all that. Mm-hmm. And my brother John was like, "Every place is the same." 
<laughs> like, yeah. No, no, no. No, we, no. We reject that. We reject that. Well, like, he had a point. He had a point. It's becoming the same. Yeah. Yeah. So, do you think you're making it work? Do you think you can make it work? Uh, I don't want to stay here. Um, yeah. Yeah. So that's that's the next step is figuring out what what to do next. Mm -hmm. It's just it's just a matter of being able to save the money to do it and having a plan, an exit strategy, because it's yeah. very a, hard to save money here. There's a song in the musical Rent that goes, we're opening a restaurant in Santa Fe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Something like that's, that. Something that's, like that. That's me. <laughs> right. Your, your husband works in, 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 in food, too? Yeah, he also, he's but he's, he's had a hard time finding th places. He keeps op working for places and they keep closing. Oh, well, um, yeah. That's that's a thing, but yeah. Literally has happened three times in a row, Ugh. and that it's there's nothing there's nothing to be done about it. There's nothing right. we can do about it. All right. I mean, it's what it's it, this things happen. I mean, this is yeah. this is I'm not sanguine or or what's the word? I don't think it's terrible. I don't think it's the worst thing. Mm -hmm. Lots of people host open restaurants. And lots of them close. Yeah, and right? especially you know. people yeah, like that's always, without, that's always been a thing. There's right. always churn, and there's always people who start out who are more idealistic than than sensible. Right. And mm -hmm. Bourdain called those like the ch those people the chum of the restaurant business because eventually you would get to like buy off their as they auctioned off okay. all their fixtures and everything. Right, there'd be the stuff, no, right? There's no there's no such thing as a restaurant that opens with a hundred percent new furnishings. Yeah, right. exactly. You know, we all go and and scavenge. And scavenge yeah. the auction, right? Yeah. yeah. So we the pick it over. That, yeah, yeah, and that's. I think that's okay. I think that's fine. That lots of businesses start, and even if seventy five percent of them fail, twenty five percent of them stick around and grow and develop, and hopefully are are healthy and functioning, right? And mm -hmm. if they're engaging their workers in a moral way, then you know what. It's all good. It's all good. But what it, what happens when you add a whole rentier class on that's top of when that? It gets sitting ugly. On, standing that, on everyone's well, neck. Of, I mean, yeah, that's where it gets of, nasty. Most of the base models for restaurants don't involve treating the the employees well. Yeah. Precisely right. So yeah. that's that's a problem too. Really, right. really, to fix the industry, it has to be completely reformulated. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, work, there's the, work there's ownership. the restaurants. Yeah, there's the restaurants that have um, abolished tipping. Mm -hmm. um, which is usually a great start because that, um, you know, that's, it, there's a lot of, there's always a lot of animosity from the kitchen to the front of the house because oh, they, they get tips. well, they, they have tips and they don't know enough to not brag about them in front of the cooks and the cooks are making the same money no matter <laughs> how many people you served. Yeah. You know, you have, you have a night where you have 40 covers, you have a night where you have... 120 covers plus a 40 person private party where the restaurant is making a ton of money off that party the servers are making a ton of money off that party mm -hmm. the kitchen is making the same amount of money to work Regardless. five times as hard Ouch. right yeah so that's so that's yeah it's that's a very a unequal bit. system um right. and it, it needs to be fixed and there are there are places that are doing it there's a lot of i've been reading about a lot of bakeries um around the country that now have collective ownership mm -hmm. um I, I really it's a it's just as far as uh my hometown is from here but i really want to get out to buffalo and visit the bread hive at some point they're a collectively oh, owned bakery yeah i've heard about um, this place yeah I, I mean apparently their their products are also absolutely amazing but mm -hmm. um they are they are a worker-owned um mm -hmm. bakery and yeah. you know I, I think that's that's the way to go that's i personally do not want to own a business that is not collectively owned i feel like that's unethical mm -hmm. Yes. I feel uh, like that's, and I feel like it's too much. It's that's the kind of thing where you end up getting pulled away, and you're just running a business instead of making the food. Mm -hmm. Right. And I always want to be making the food. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I also would like to have more control over what's happening with the business. Precisely. Yeah. It's. it's yeah. It's, I, I'm not sure that there's a moral arrangement that isn't worker owned. Yeah. I'm not convinced that there is. Um, no, I mean, I'm I, open I, to I, you know debate, but right. I don't. I don't think that there is. Right. Yeah. It's you know a democratically controlled workplace is the best outcome right and so that's when i sort of like demur and say or demur and say oh it should be morally run that's basically what i mean right mm -hmm. I, I can imagine a family business 
possibly that could be moral. And um, yeah, that's so, well, yeah, that's if it's something that's a lot like, of family that have been passed down by generations and, and are very closely yeah. held and have yeah, I don't know. that's 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 a little bit different. It's and, a little bit you different. Always, you always have you always have the risk of somebody in one of the younger generations saying, "Let's franchise this. Let's franchise this. Let's take this to the <laughs> next level." And then it can I've get seen, really ugly. I've, I've I've seen that. I've I've seen. I've seen, right. I've seen examples of that on, on like food TV and stuff where they're right. like, you know, oh, dad, why don't we sell blah, blah, blah. It's like, because we make it. Because we make it. Sell? Why we would sell we sell that to other people? That's, huh. That's weird, right? And so, yeah. yeah so I, for my part, if hundreds of people want to get together and start a worker owned bakery, restaurant, cafe, whatever, it's really okay. It's just fine. And some of them will That's fail great. and some of them will succeed. And it's okay. Um, I think you learn I think something. Within you keep that, trying. though, you've got a structure of other places that have done it successfully to lean on. To le- exactly. And exactly. Like, in California, I think somewhere there's a group that are. It's they share the same recipes. They have the same name, but each one is individually owned by the workers. Precisely. But they do. They do support each other. Mm-hmm. So you know, well, it's basically sort problem, of like um, call uh, the other ones an intellectual property infrastructure. Mm-hmm. Of how to do this. So you're yeah. not just going in cold. And I think if you iterate through that, like everybody comes, starts a business, you do that enough times, you know, you'll be cooking with gas after a while. It'll, you yeah. know, it'll, it'll work itself out. It's, so there, it there's is, these, it yeah. is a process of normalizing that as a, as a structure. Yes, absolutely. It just needs to become more common and people will begin to see. You're, I mean, it's there's always people who would never adopt it because they want ownership and they don't want to share that with their workers but and they you know to see they more can of go them do that succeed is good for everybody right it's good for everybody and but personally i i would want our legal environment to make the person that wants ownership and to keep them in that space of family ownership that they shouldn't be in this position where they're like hey let's see how many people we can exploit and how much money you can make with grandma's tomato sauce recipe. You know, right, right. <laughs> that, that yeah, should never be. Let's take grandma's tomato sauce recipe and, and jar it. And, and jar it. Walmart. Right. That, and that doesn't work. I don't know what, I don't know the state needs to be in the business of enabling that. That just seems absurd to me. So mm-hmm. all this is to say some of this like churn in the industry is, you know, it happens and it's, it's tough to live through. It can be really tough to live through, but I think it, it's on this pathway to settling itself out, where people can find their way into some of this worker ownership and find their way into some of this these uh, more humane environments to work in. That you got to kind of like, you know, kind of like a dating relationship. You got to check a few people out before you find the right one. You know. Yeah, you have to you have to seek it out. At this point, you do have to seek it out, and you know that's that's kind of what I've been trying to do is to get a feel for how more of them work. Like mm-hmm. I said, I really want to go visit one and, and talk to the workers there and, and get some, some insight on how one might go about setting something like this up somewhere else. Yeah. And doing other things. And, you know, that, that, that's, that's my dream is to have something like that where I'm just collaborating with a bunch of other – I kind of think of us as artists to make yeah. edible work edible for art. people. Yeah. No, and that's awesome. That's, you know, that would be great and just to have, you know – things everything democratic what are our specials today that's democratic are we going to work with this farm that's democratic you know right just to, to support the actual community that we're in awesome i think paul's got a did you pick out a clip or um yeah hang on he got quiet for a while he went to get the book <laughs> so you were talking about uh, luxuries, and this is a passage from uh, Down and Out in Paris and London from Chapter 22, which is a, an amazing chapter where uh, he sort of stops telling the story and starts telling, talking about like the philosophy uh, oh, of yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the job he's describing was the plongeur, mm-hmm. the the sort of the the lowest level kitchen staff and it's not this, right. the you know the cooks and chefs were steps up from this but it, it's right. sort of applicable to like labor you know as a labor thing in general, in general. Right. so he says is a plongeur's work really necessarily necessary to civilization we have a vague feeling that it must be honest work 
because it is hard and disagreeable, and we've made a sort of fetish of manual work. We see a man cutting down a tree, and we make sure that he is filling a social need just because he uses his muscles. It does not occur to us that he may only be cutting down a beautiful tree to make room for a hideous statue. (laughs) (laughs) I believe it is the same with a plongeur. He earns his bread in the sweat of his brow, but it does not follow that he is doing anything useful. He may only be supplying a luxury, which very often is not a luxury. And so he talks about a lot about how a lot of these luxury things are... um, no one really it's it's they are status symbols rather than than fundamental pleasures basic pleasures right. of life right. similarly with the plongeur he is a king compared with a rickshaw puller or a gary pony but his case is analogous he is a slave of a hotel or a restaurant and his slavery is more or less useless for after all where is the real need of big hotels and smart restaurants they are supposed to provide luxury but in reality, they provide only a cheap, shoddy imitation of it. Nearly everyone hates hotels. Some restaurants are better than others, but it is impossible to get as good a meal in a restaurant as one can get for the same expense in a private house. So I don't know if this is, I'm not sure this is true in, you know, it's true in a sense. In a sense, yeah, no, it is. Mm-hmm. But but he's just spent the rest of the first you know two thirds of the book talking about what really goes on in the kitchen and right. you know uh, mm-hmm. no doubt hotels and restaurants must exist but there is no need that they should enslave hundreds of people what makes them work what makes the work in them is not the essentials it is the shams that are supposed to represent luxury smartness as it is called, means in effect merely that the staff work more and the customers pay more. No one benefits except the proprietor, who will presently buy himself a striped villa at Duville. Eventually, essentially, a smart hotel is a place where a hundred people toil like devils in order that two hundred may pay through the nose for things they do not really want. <laughs> <laughs> if the nonsense were cut out of hotels and restaurants... And the work done with simple efficiency, plongeurs might work six or eight hours a day instead of 10 or 15. So he talks a lot about the reasons behind this excess work, right? Right. And it's, it's really the extraction of value. Right. Mm-hmm. So this instinct That's... to perpetuate useless work is at bottom simply fear of the mob. The mob, the thought runs, are such low animals that they would be dangerous if they had leisure. It is safer to keep them too busy to think. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, it works. It works to this day. Some do that, yeah. Yeah. So, the mass of the rich and the poor are differentiated by their incomes and nothing else, and the average millionaire is only the average dishwasher dressed in a new suit. Change places, and handy-dandy, which one is the justice, which is the thief? Everyone who has mixed on equal terms with the poor knows this quite well, but the trouble is that intelligent, cultivated people, the very people who might be expected to have liberal opinions, never do mix with the poor. (laughs) (laughs) Not at all. It talks about this generating ignorance. The educated man pictures a horde of sub-men wanting only a day's liberty, to loot his house, burn his books, and set him to work minding a machine or sweeping out a lavatory. Anything, he thinks, any injustice, sooner than let that mob loose. He does not see that since there is no difference between the mass of rich and poor, there is no question of setting the mob loose. The mob is in fact loose now, and in the shape of rich men, is using its power to set up enormous treadmills of boredom, such as smart hotels. Oh dear, you may be onto something. <laughs> anyway, it's actually I... similar to something they mentioned in that that article I was reading about the uh, investors in New York. How a lot of the new buildings they are building are designed like a hotel, and that you never have to leave. Full amenities on site. Yes. Yeah. Anything, anything to wall themselves off from everybody else. So, like, you just wouldn't walk outside for the sake of I don't know, seeing the city. No. No, you wouldn't. You'd have you'd have all of your you'd have your 
your gym inside. You can get anything you want delivered in the city at this point. Your groceries, takeout, laundry, whatever. And they would have like indoor gardens. So you really wouldn't have to leave. You can get in a, in a, a chauffeured car and go somewhere else and then come right back. That's surreal. Which is, what what's is. the point yeah. of living there? <laughs> it's it's yeah. not that far from a sealed up arcology that's, you know, 100 floors high where the people on the top never come down. Never come down. Mm-hmm. So. Well, that's where the air is good, you know? <laughs> you open yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway. Ouch. So um, we're going to share some links. Do you want to yeah. tell us anything else about like... Uh, like what's, lessons, like parting thoughts or like... Well, yeah. What's what's a work day look like for you? Like you share oh, these oh, pictures yeah, yeah. where like oh, I see your roasted apples and cool stuff like that, and I hear oh. you talking about cardamom sauce, and I'm drooling on my keyboard at work. <laughs> but I like, so what's what's a work day look like? Uh, from beginning to end, most days I'm up uh, between six and seven. I get to work. Uh, usually by 8 a.m. Sometimes, some days I have to be in earlier, some days I have to be in later, but most days it's 8 a.m. Uh, I have to spin all of my sorbets. Um, we melt them down at the end of the night and spin them fresh every day so they're nice and fluffy and creamy. Mm-hmm. Um, sorbets are the one without, ones mm-hmm. without dairy, but okay. the ice cream stay in the freezer. Yeah. Um, we have to bake um, focaccia twice fresh daily for every service. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm there for that. I have to go up to meetings twice a day before every sh- before each each service. So that's a, like 11:45 for lunch and uh, four o'clock for dinner because we open at 4:30. And then um, at those meetings, you're like telling people what you're serving, what specials. Yeah, and- yeah, going over the specials, the flavors of the ice creams and sorbets for the day, any changes to like the cheese plate, which I also do. Um, there's a lot of things on my menu where the fruit just changes seasonally because we get a lot of stuff from local farms. So I tell them that. Um, and then uh, dinner service starts at 4.30 and I usually stay at least through the first seating of people, um, which because we're close to all the Broadway theaters is usually the busiest because everyone's eating before they go to a show. Mm-hmm. Um, my average day ends up being between 12 and 14 hours. Wow. Um, okay. And I'm salaried, <laughs> so it doesn't matter. It doesn't, doesn't matter yeah. how long I stay. You don't get make the same amount yeah. of money. I don't get overtime. I don't get tipped. I make the same every week, no matter what. Mm-hmm. Um, so my days are very, very long, and it's really hard to fit time in to do anything for myself or anything that's you know an interest outside of work. My commute is at minimum forty minutes, forty to fifty minutes wow. each way. Um, God almighty. Yeah. So I usually, yeah, I usually take a, a walk after work because I just mm-hmm. need to get outside and get in the air, get some exercise. I love, I love walking around at night. So yeah, it's not that's that's nice, but it's still you know, and then and then the trains don't work half the time. <laughs> so sometimes <laughs> it takes me two hours it's to get home. Way. Who knows? Thanks, right. Cuomo. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so so yeah, that's yeah. that's how my days usually go. They're very long. Um, if I'm lucky, twice a week there's the, the there's a nice older couple that comes from upstate with the farm stuff, um, mm-hmm. and I go outside and talk to them, and they feed me some fruit, and that's always kind of a highlight. Um, yeah. So there are some there are some nice perks to it, but normally I'm just in a basement for twelve hours a day. Oh, good God! Wow. Well, it's not <laughs> uh, you're not working in a room with six open flames where it's 180 degrees like in uh, Orwell's day, no. but. Usually not, not, not yeah. unless not unless the city shut off the water tower again, so I can't run the AC, and then it gets pretty hot down there. Oh, gosh, okay. I can only imagine. Yeah. But, yeah. So things have improved. The, yeah, that's, I kept uh, reading. I've been actually reading down and out in Paris and London to to our kids for bedtime stories. Oh, I have wow. I have to censor certain stories and passages. Right. And right. Some information. There's a lot of anti-Semitism right. going on in some of his writing, but you know. Yeah, I, I need to reread it. I haven't read it in a long time. But it's uh, but they love like the graphic descriptions of 
his work working, of the work they're absolutely fascinated by this yeah uh, the descriptions of of the kitchens are, yeah, are yeah. amazing it's still yeah. very accurate in a lot of restaurant kitchens yeah very and very oh accurate. yeah especially he's describing uh at one point the job of handling essentially he was handling room service with a whole bank of dumb waiters mm-hmm. where he had to like uh, had to slips of paper coming down and all this breakfast food and drinks and everything going back up right. and yeah. it describes you know if you drop a piece of toast on the floor what you're going to make a new piece of toast <laughs> no, i don't <laughs> think so <laughs> just saying yeah so no it's it's terrific and i think material conditions for restaurant workers have improved somewhat and sanitation sanitation bit. has improved somewhat yes Sanitation absolutely has, yes. yeah. That's, but, no, it's yeah. it's crazy reading accounts of yeah. how a lot of restaurants back then used to do things, or in pastry reading about how a lot of the convents, like the Italian convents, were the ones who made all the sweets, mm-hmm. and just the amount of work, like that, then physical power and labor that goes into producing things that we do with machines now is absolutely nuts. Mm-hmm. And to know that yeah. we're working yeah. so hard, and people back then also were working yeah. so much harder. Right, and you do you know, feel there's no there's no reason for it in either either time in either context, right? Do you feel uh, uh, like is that gratifying to feel like this connection when you're making like historic recipes and the traditions of of cooking these dishes? Do you get into like the um, old old recipes? I do, well, I like to do I like to do a little research on why things are the way they are, and especially because I mostly have worked in Italian places, mm-hmm. there's a lot of really interesting history behind a lot of dishes. Yeah, I'm sure. Um, like, for example, we started serving a chocolate, a flourless chocolate cake, and it's called the Tenerina Cake, and it's named after, or in honor of, um, the woman who was the, the queen of Italy. Uh, going into World War II, and she fled the country, but then she had a daughter named Mafalda who stayed behind and was eventually captured by the Nazis, and she died in, in a concentration camp, wow. and the people of Italy named a pasta shape called Mafalda, uh, Mafaldina after her, <laughs> Mafaldina. and we yeah. serve that at the restaurant, too, so it's I like, got to give everyone like a history lesson. It's, it's like, it's like it's Trump's, Trump's really tweets, there's always a pasta, right? There's always a pasta. <laughs> Yeah, there's no, so it's, many it's Italian pasta shapes. Yeah. So much is between between Italy and France too, because neither of them can let the other one have anything culinarily. <laughs> like, ciabatta yeah. was invented because baguettes were becoming too popular, and <laughs> the French were so mad that the Italians thought of zabaione first. So, so yeah. it's it's very very. And the only reason they have any good desserts at all in Italy is because they used to hire French pastry chefs. So. See? It's yeah. it's a very interesting. I I do I do like throwing out the historical footnotes and giving people the reasoning behind stuff like that and 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 definitely digging into some of the more obscure difficult recipes is a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, no and I, and I want to know like what do you what would you say that you've learned that you'd want other millennials to know other folks uh you know trying to get by in the world today? Lessons learned. Any, just any sort of thoughts? Um, you don't have to do anything alone. Uh, it is very, very helpful to be able to reach out and share your experiences uh, mm-hmm. with other people. Um, I mean, the obvious end point of that is to be able to form a union or something like that. Um, but you don't, you don't have to take anything by yourself. You don't have to take anything alone. Right. There's always people who are being, who are in the same shoes you were or they were. And there's always people that you can collectivize and, and form solidarity with. Always. Right on. Cool. cool. All right. I think, uh, I think we're there. I think we're there. <gasps> yeah. Thank you so much for taking uh, the time out of your day off to uh, to talk to us. We really appreciate it. It's been no, fun. Thanks for having me. This was great. I was looking forward to it all day. Cool. Awesome. Good. Okay. You've been listening to the Grace and Paul Podcast. Check out the show blog at podcast.blogspot.com where you can leave comments or search for the Grace and Paul Podcast on Facebook or YouTube. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks a lot, Anna. Thanks, Anna. See ya. All right, take care. Yeah, thanks, guys.